So where we stopped um, was uh, that Ash character uh, plays a significant role on uh, gasifier selection. Um, we will have a separate module on Ash composition and its effect on viscosity uh, later on. But this graph that we that I showed in here it uh, it shows how the ash character can be extremely unpredictable uh, depending on what wherever the temperature is and it varies with the uh, type of the cone so um, this is uh, one this is one um, simple uh, graph that um, people often use, uh, the engineers often use. I have taken it directly from the gasification book by Higman and Vanderbach. Uh, it, uh, it uh, presents on the x-axis a, a certain ratio, um, which is uh, denoted here. And uh, on the y-axis, it is the temperature. As, as you would as you would expect these are all uh, these 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 are all alkaline element so if the ratio increases in value then usually uh, we say that the ash is very alkaline okay and the ratio if the ratio is <coughs> one or less than one then we say that the uh, ash is acidic so depending on that, a very, um, very rough rule of thumb is um, this is what in um, the gasifier manufacturers often uh, use and has, it has been developed from experimental work, significant amount of experimental work and expertise. That if the um, um, ash is very acidic, then it can uh, the the temperature, fluidus, fluidus temperature can uh, vary significantly. And uh, if it is in this region, the alkaline region, then the fluidized temperature, uh, fluidus temperature uh, varies um, and then beyond a certain ratio, the, um, the temperature becomes more or less um, uh, constant. So um, knowing the ash composition is quite useful, uh, important. Nevertheless, uh, it is not the sole predictor. I mean, you cannot say that this will work for all types of coal, low rank versus higher rank. You still have to go into the nitty gritties quite a bit. This gives you only fast um, uh, impression rule of thumb, nothing else. You won't uh, develop any, uh, you won't make any decision based on this and this alone. Uh, temperature is the uh, uh, temperature at which it becomes, the ash becomes fluid. Because as, as I uh, discussed the other day, the, um, if it is entrained flow gasifier, then the uh, ash has to become liquid and it has to flow. If it is dry ash gasifier, it will not uh, uh, allow a temperature to occur that will, that will make it fluid. And if it is fluidized bed gasifier, then you will be somewhere in between, but not, it should not be, the ash should not be semi-solid, semi-fluid because then it becomes difficult to handle. So that's why this is extremely important. That's what it means. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, these, these are all um, developed based on high, high rank coal, unfortunately. And uh, it's primarily because a majority of the gasification experience has been on high rank coal. So the point I'm making is, even though in fluidized bed gasification, we will stay below 1,200 degrees Celsius, but 
this will give you the first card uh, uh, impression about what direction we should be going, but, but this is not uh, on which we will be solely making our decision. Now, the other thing in here is that, okay, inside the gasifier, the temperature can be 900, um, uh, as indicated by the thermocouples, the gas temperature, the void temperature. But the particles can be easily 200 degrees centigrade higher, particle temperature. So that has to be taken into account when considering this fluid ice, fluid, uh, fluid temperature or fluid ice uh, temperature. Um, it should not be target. Um, so the um, 25 Pascal second, 25 to 150 Pascal per second is the range within which the um, gasifier manufacturers want to operate. Because if, if the viscosity is too low, then as I said the other day, the ash will flow out very, very quickly, um, uh, not matching with the rate at which it is being formed. And therefore, the water wall will not remain protected. And if it is, if it is over 150, then there will be a lot more deposit. It will not be flowing out. Then, there, then that will impede the heat transfer. So the watt target is not the right thing. I, I did change it this morning. Maybe I forgot to um, forgot to uh, save save the file. Slagging gasifier and drain flow gasifier. Correct. Correct. Temperature. Temperature. Yes, that's right. So if you give them the composition of the coal and the ash, and if they see that that's within their um, experience database, then they will say, yes, we can do it. If not, they will go, in, go ahead with the measurements. And um, so one of the uh, projects that we finished in 2016 for the Mitsubishi is um, that um, there are different models available for predicting viscosity. And I have a module for that. Um, but none of those models carefully, uh, sorry, I mean accurately predicted the viscosity. Uh, because the temperature for um, developing that uh, temperature for having that viscosity range between 25 and 150, it is so impractically low that you would immediately know that, um, that uh, the model is not good. So um, these models are models. I, I, I think what I will do is I will actually bring up that one immediately after this module before going into the other one as it remains uh, fresh. So let's talk a little bit of kinetics of gasification because that's what is important for gasifier sizing. Even though um, the gasifier manufacturers, they have their database, etc., but you often they ask, look, I mean, how reactive this coal is? How much carbon conversion can you get out of this coal? for fluidized bed operation or for entrain flow operation as a function of temperature. If you cannot provide it as a client, obviously they will develop it. Um, but I thought it will be uh, important to give a, some simple basics as to how these are done. And this is how uh, these are done. As we know, those who have done uh, react chemical engineering, that this is a 
simple, very simple formulation uh, which um, relates the volume of a reactor, gasifier is a reactor, uh, volume of a reactor with the reaction rate which is in the denominator with the carbon conversion which is X in the numerator and the flow rate, the molar flow rate in this instance. So it is the reaction rate which is the most important thing. So if you know that um, this is my flow rate going into the gasifier of the reactant, and those reactants can be mix of carbon dioxide and steam, or one or the other, or both, um, um, then, uh, then you can uh, ask, interrogate the formulation okay, if I want 90 percent carbon conversion, what sort of volume I will require. Remember though, it's not go going to be the, just the, it's not going to be the volume of the gasifier, it's just going to be the volume of the reaction zone, where you will try to get the maximum carbon conversion. There will be other volumes that would be necessary to provide over and below that. And we'll come to that when we talk about some of the ga different gasifiers. Anyway, keeping things very simple, um, um, any gas solid reaction and coal gasification is no exception. It's a gas solid reaction always. You it, it, uh, uh, it's based on seven different steps, right? The first step is that the reactant has to percolate through the bulk uh, surrounding the bulk atmosphere, surrounding the particle. Um, then the second is that um, second step is that after um, percolating through the surrounding atmosphere, it has to reach the surface of the um, of the particle, the active sites inside the particle where reactions can take place, not the entire surface can be an active site, even though you can convert a lot of the surfaces into active sites. Then it has to react um, and then <coughs> um, and then the step five, six, and seven are exactly the opposite of step one, two, and three. So this is very standard chemical reaction engineering that we um, study at uh, third year level or wherever. So the important thing then is uh, when we come to the kinetics of gasification, uh, there are um, three distinct zones. And then I will come back to that seventh step a little bit later. Um, there are three different zones. One is the uh, low temperature zone, because as a particle, coal particle goes inside the gasifier, it will, it will gradually um, um, see its, um, it gradually become high temperature, uh, a high temperature particle however fast it is. So it will pass through a slow, low temperature zone, it will pass through a high temperature zone, a medium temperature zone, and then it will pass through a high temperature zone. So what we say is that at low temperature zone, where this is the uh, rate limiting step, um, uh, the, in which the chemical reaction is the rate limiting step and experimentally observed activation energy is a true activation energy. So rate limiting step you all understand, right, what it is. Um, rate limiting step is, uh, rate lim yeah. So rate limiting step is nothing but say you have a group of 15 people working and, the, uh, and if there has to be a harmony in the group, the, um, uh, the uh, walking speed of the group will be will be linked to the uh, walking speed of the slowest possible person. So what happens is uh, the bulk diffusion and internal diffusion, et cetera, do not uh, control if the rate limiting step. We carry out experiments in the lab, everyone, um, to find, the, to, to calculate the activation energy and the pre-exponential constants. Um, at the low temperature zone. 
because that will be a true chemical reaction controlling uh, zone. Uh, and therefore, whatever activation energy you will get is the true activation energy, even though in reality that is not what will happen. I will come to that. Um, then the medium temperature zone in which the rate of chemical reaction is higher, and um, but is limited by the internal diffusion of the gaseous reactants through the pores. So, the um, gaseous reactants have come from the outside of the boundary onto the surface, then it is going inside. So, that is the internal uh, diffusion. And the observed activation energy there is only about half of the true value which corresponds to that of the chemical reaction zone, uh, chemical reaction rate controlling step uh, zone. And then the high temperature zone in which external bulk surface diffusion of the gaseous reactants is rate controlling and the apparent activation energy is very small. So, this is pretty uh, common sense that uh, if you have already a particle in very high at a very high very high temperature, then uh, you would not uh, need to provide much activation energy. Activation energy is what? Activation energy is nothing but to the energy that you need to supply uh, before the reaction can be initiated that is uh, activation energy. And then on the other side you have um, pre exponential constant. Um, um, what is pre exponential constant? So, it is a frequency factor. Frequency of what? Between? Right. So, um, providing the activation energy is not going to help unless you are also creating an atmosphere that, uh, that um, uh, provides an atmosphere that is conducive to having the right pre exponential factor. So, pre exponential factor is also very, very important. Um, uh, that means, uh, how the uh, reactants can collide, reactant molecules can collide with one another and that is usually provided by provide giving swill to the gaseous reactants that comes into it or by other means also. So, it is very, very important. Correct. Okay. Correct. Good direction of the equation. Yes. So, internal diffusion and bulk surface diffusion are two different things. Um, so, if you have a, um, if you have If this is your cold particle, for example, very idealized cold particle, then out on, um, um, external to that you have a layer of gases, right, which consists of, um, in here it may consist of CO2, H2O, um, hydrogen, CO, methane, etcetera depending on how advanced the gasification is. Now, when are you, when you are sending uh, um, reactant gases from outside, which is oxygen, CO2, maybe steam as well, then this has to enter through its barrier, reach the surface of it. So, this is bulk diffusion or external diffusion. Then once it reaches here, it then has to go through the pores and then get into the active sites. So, this is internal diffusion. So, that is step number 2 over there and the, this is step number 1. And then it takes the reaction and that is step number 3 and then the products then go out 
through the uh, uh, overcoming the internal diffusion barrier there on the way out, and then four, five. That's right. Uh, they can. In situ, they can. If you are providing the atmosphere for doing it. Usually, what happens is, um, because pyrolysis is very fast, uh, a coal particle disintegrates very quickly and it, it develops a pressure as well of the, and the pressure of the volatiles actually forces it out. Um, and therefore, usually it does not remain as active as the other ones that you are, uh, uh, that you are required to feed in. So, it is um, it's important to realize that some of these can take part, but not much. What is not much, no one knows. So, what happens is, you can carry out experiments in, um, in the TGA, maybe what I will do is, I will have couple of slides um, in, in, in one presentation tomorrow, where I will show how we calculate it. But let me tell you why, how we calculate it. So, you put a certain sample of mass in the uh, TGA, then depending on whatever environment you want to measure the reactivity, whether it is CO2 gasification reactivity or steam gasification reactivity, say steam gasification reactivity, then you um, put in um, the amount of steam that you want to put in. So, in a gasifier for example, uh, the over, in the overall atmosphere, steam will be about 15 percent, 1.5. So, um, so, you are looking at, beyond that steam will have no effect, beyond that steam will have any effect of um, controlling the temperature, nothing else. Um, so, so, you mix the gas with 15 percent steam and remaining 85 percent is the um, uh, inert gas. So, that can be high purity nitrogen or helium or argon, whatever, whatever is cheaper. So, you take the particles of the appropriate size and you can do experiments with different particle sizes 25 to 35, 35 to 45, 45 to 55, 53. 53 to 63, so and so forth. You can go on, and then you um, feed the, feed that gas. You uh, then measure the signals to interpret at what rate it is losing weight as a consequence of gasification, and you do that with char, not with coal, because if you do that with coal, you will see the total effect of pyrolysis and gasification. So, you do your pyrolysis experiments first, that will give you the 
um, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, weight loss signal or weight loss curve. You keep it. Then you do the uh, gasification uh, work uh, with the char, which, ha which you have generated from your pyrolysis experiment, and then subject that to the, this kind of, kind of test. Now, how do we measure it? How do we actually calculate it? So you can do it in different ways. Um, do it in different ways. Um, so this is the standard Arrhenius expression. Here, this is the pre-exponential constant, this is the activation energy, and this is the reaction uh, order. Right. So there are at least three variables. So you need to need to have at least three measurements. But usually, uh, it's much better to have a lot more than that. And on this side, you have dW dt, weight loss, as a function of time. Then if you have all of these three variables, and then if you, um, uh, ca you can calculate uh, uh, for the um, reaction order first. Uh, and then if you start plotting as a function of temperature or inverse of temperature, uh, this is in Kelvin. Um, this is in react reactivity, which is nothing but reactivity. Then you will see some distinct region. So these are three different regions. This is the region where you will get the activation energy. So to answer your question, it can be done from the TGA, and it is done from the TGA. The important thing is, in doing so, um, there are a lot of variables. It's not as simple as I have. Uh, uh, I, I am giving you. The, it's, you should not get that impression that it is as simple as that. You really need to create an atmosphere whereby um, the external diffusion can be eliminated. Now, how external diffusion can be eliminated? If you force, I mean, it, it is not a rate limiting factor, as you would expect. If you feed only a little bit of the gas, gas flow rate, then it will be limited by external diffusion. So what do you do? You feed in a lot of gas. Typically, people have found out for a particular machine, it depends on the TGA instrument, type of TGA instrument. People have found that if you are doing it on the basis of about, say, 100 to 120 um, milliliter per minute, uh, of gas flow, remembering that your sample quantity inside the crucible is only of the order of few milligrams, about 10, 15 milligrams at most. That is important, I'll come to that. So you overcome that diffusion barrier by feeding in a lot of gas. So, so you create the condition that way. You also overcome the external diffusion by putting in less sample. Because as you would expect, if this is your crucible, if this is your crucible, and if you fill it up, then the gas will find it difficult so to penetrate. So what you do is you fill only, uh, or you put only tiny amount. Again, this is uh, the, this is the first thing that the students study to establish that for this particle size. I will be using only this much sample so that I can eliminate with as much accurate, with as much certainty as possible uh, uh, the external diffusion. And that certainty is about 10 milligram. Anything over than that, you will be slowly going into that. But in a in a in a real gasifier, what happens? In a real gasifier, what happens is 
the particle goes through different temperature zones, low temperature, medium temperature, and then it goes straight to the high temperature zone very, very quickly, right, depending on the particle size. So, in as much as knowing the true activation energy is important, fundamental uh, information that this is the maximum amount of activation energy that you have to provide by either preheating the reactor with gas or some other means. Um, the actual activation energy will actually lie between any three of these. But, but nothing is, uh, what I am saying is that it is it's, it's not as if knowing the true activation energy is not important. Here, this zone, low temperature zone, true activation energy is the guiding factor. That amount of activation energy has to be provided somehow, even though here the activation energy is only a fraction of the true activation energy. Why? Because here temperature is already high. So, somehow or the other you have already provided that activation energy. And how much is that activation energy? It is the one that you calculate from here. So, the point I am trying to make is there is no substitute for not measuring or not calculating the true activation energy. Okay. Have I been able to explain properly or it is a bit convoluted? If the objective of your simulation is to predict the gas composition and carbon conversion at the outlet, um, <coughs> then the, from, uh, the um, getting the kinetics is not very much, the getting, not getting the absolute kinetics, the TG, uh, activation energy and P exponential uh, factors are the part of kinetics, kinetic data not getting it, not getting the right one is not an issue, because in all probabilities you will be going to the uh, equilibrium composition zone anyway. Okay. And equilibrium composition does not relate to, does not depend on kinetic data. But, if your focus is also on carbon conversion, which is a kinetic thing, then it is useful to cross check that. And so, either way I think it is good to have the right kinetic data put in, then you are sure that nothing can go horribly wrong. Yeah. yeah. So, what happens, yes you can do that experimentally. So, you can do the, uh, um, do the equilibrium calculation to find out this will be my gas composition at the end. You carry out the experiment, if you see a difference from it lower than that, it has not reached equilibrium as simple, that is what we do. Because, because that is the upper limit more or less, and that is what you try to achieve. Uh, underachieving is not an option. Mm. 
So carbon conversion and gas composition are two different things. One doesn't rely on the other truly because as you have the coal particle or the char particle and it is being gradually eaten away by the gasifying agent say steam or carbon dioxide or all it will it will give you the gas carbon monoxide and um, uh, hydrogen etc right so irrespective of the carbon conversion you will still get that gas right so whether the carbon conversion is 30% or it is 95 percent, you will still continue to get the gas which will contribute to your gas composition. Now, so for, um, I'm talking about say char gasification now. From uh, pyrolysis, you have generated whatever gas you have generated, CO, hydrogen, CO2, methane, um, etc then what remains is the char and that char is that char is um, um, reacting with your reaction agent uh, carbon dioxide carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide hydro, uh, water vapor or steam and um, oxygen actual oxygen so the point i'm making is you will still get your gas composition for a certain temperature irrespective of where carbon conversion is, here or here or here. But obviously, your, your objective is to get the highest possible carbon conversion. Otherwise, you are wasting the fuel. In experiments, so um, what you do is, uh, say you have a fluid ice beam. So you can run it for one minute at, at that particular temperature, cool everything down, quench everything down, and then take the sample out, put it in the TGA, and then see how much carbon has remained. And then by difference, how much carbon you put, how much carbon is, has come out, that is the carbon conversion. So carbon conversion is nothing, nothing but this. Uh, nothing but um, carbon in by carbon out divided by carbon in. So in the TGA crucible, uh, um, you have in here, so you know exactly how much carbon is there based on the ultimate analysis. And then at the, at the, um, so at the end, if you, um, if you are burning that carbon in the TGA, that carbon has come from your gasifier, burning it off, then you know exactly how much carbon was left at the, at the bottom of the gasifier. So that's how you do it, experimentally. This only way that you can experiment, do it is experimentally, no other way. But that's the beauty of the modeling, that if you can somehow, um, somehow put it in the model, uh, and then the model allows you to predict the carbon conversion as a function of a time, then you are avoiding the need for experiments which are very energy intensive, labor intensive too. Correct. Correct. So in simulation you will be do doing an elemental balance anyway, right? So one of the elemental balance is of carbon, and that will give you that. So that's why you provide a carbon neutral condition. So as you work up the diffusion uh, barrier, so that the diffusion doesn't become a vacuum mixture. So in the TGA experiment, to calculate the activation energy, you create a condition which takes you Uh, and that is the rule of thumb 
some of the changes that we initially intermittent to to the Middle East experience before we carry out the climatic experience. And if you can determine what should be my gas flow limits. Otherwise, you know, how would you know whether it is uh, 14, 20 millimeters per second gas flow or 20,000 millimeters per second gas flow? So that's an absolutely task necessity for us to understand. The other one that one has to also do is to uh, sample quantity. What should be the sample quantity uh, for which you can be reasonably certain that I am not into the depletion control zone? These two sets of experiments, and these are not single experiments. You have to do 10 milligram, 20 milligram, 30, 40, 50 milligram, etc. And to find out that which one is more effective by Zero sum, and what's the exception now, uh, irrespective of whoever supplies the PPA, whether it be Partner or Nex or some other company or uh, some other company, can be done and, and chemically completely uh, and give you to create the conditions that will allow you to calculate the full population change. Extremely important. Uh, Jella is a good, a very good point. Um, for gasification, you will start with the practical test. You cannot say that I will uh, just because 25 to 35 micron particles will give me the full activation energy, I will only find the full activation energy for that day. Because in the intensity of the particle development, you will be using a linear particle size, particle size distribution. You cannot do that. You cannot generate a more size particle in a downtown currency. So what we will do is we say, if it is 10 to 100 microns, that's what goes into the gas plant, then you will be doing the PGA experiment with 10 to 20, 20 to 25, 25 to 35, 35 to 45, 45 to 50. These are the sieve sizes that we can buy, sieves for this product. 52 to 63, 50 to 75, 75 to 90, 90 to 125. These are the standard sieves available. <coughs> AS can calculate. <coughs> so if we do all of this for test in the Ivalo, knowing very well Because the particle size is much, much higher, 5,000 microns, right? um, uh, then the model takes care of it by incorporating the effect of heat transfer energy to the layers of the particles. Which is
the NETGA tests that will be reportable, you will have to carry out these tests with different amount of gas flows, with different amount, different particle sizes and different amount of particles. That will tell you, that will tell you where these temperatures are. See I have not told this is 700 or this is 1300 because it varies with the type of the material. So when you, um, it varies with the type of material, it varies with the gas flow, it varies with the particle size, it varies with the particle quantity. So, so you do this whole exercise. That's easily a three, four months work of a PhD student's life. From there you determine, okay, in order to measure the activation, true activation energy which is credible and which I can report, you decide the temperature, you decide the uh, quantity and decide the particle size from those initial experiments. Mm. Very true, very true.
that temperature is uh, this one uh, with the first one is usually i mean at least for our type of coal the low end coal that we deal with is really about 800 uh, anything you go over 800 then you are into the diffusion control zone port diffusion and then uh, the third one is bulk diffusion bulk diffusion is uh, Bulk diffusion and pore diffusion are very, very close, about 900, 800. One is 800, the other one is 900. So if you, <coughs> true, true. If you take a call from the one state and the another state, you cannot say that this will be the same. You really need to carry out the experiments. And biomass, exactly. Biomass is even more different, even more difficult. Uh, so there is not much data there how they account for this. They frantically look for who has published what, <laughs> some, some experimental data. And uh, because for the models, the problem is they want uh, preferably an algebraic expression, which can be easily fed. So, um, but in ideal world, you will need a person who has got very good modeling background, a hands-on modeler, and some understanding of experiments, not, not other way around. Uh, because if you have too much hands-on experience with uh, experiments, then the taste, some of them, most of them take the view that modelers are useless. So, <laughs> so <laughs> well, so just chanting out some number. So it's good to have some, uh, so that's how they do it. So it's good to have some uh, appreciation of the experimental work, because otherwise, in what condition that experimental work was, the experimental data was generated, you are not sure. So have I, yeah. have along with carbon, potassium, or sodium, or calcium, or magnesium, which are um, catalytic elements. So for the entrained flow gasification, it's not a problem. So when I say active side, I should have said um, entire surface for entrained flow gasification. For low temperature gasification, active sites are the ones uh, where you also have the simultaneous presence of the catalytic elements. Have I answered your question though?
<laughs> and there may be expressions that could be used. So these are some of the examples. These are by no means these are the only ones. There are a whole lot of um, similar expressions. Oh, oh, so so the, the first one is uh, reaction rate in presence of CO2 and CO2 gas reaction. And that was then the second one is for steam gas reaction. So there are, these all come from just a significant number of experimental data where people very carefully measure the partial products, uh, partial pressure of the reactants, the partial pressure of the products. So say for example, when you have the bottle of reactants, you have CO2. CO is your other product. So that's why we see in the denominator the partial pressure coming from the CO2. So the, as you would expect, So rather than, uh, and then there are a whole, whole sets of coefficients there, which are available. These are available in the paper. These are very, very good. Um, in what in the whichever uh, example from there in the literature. All very credible ones can be used quite well um, for good predictions. There's absolutely no um, uh, denying that. Engineers often actually use a, uh, this sort of uh, a lumped reaction model, so, uh, which is the reaction rate equal to the pre-exponential factor and the activation energy um, with, a, with an approximate reaction order. The reaction order for coal or char gasification does not vary well beyond 0.6 and about 1.5, 1.6. I, I haven't seen any literature which goes to the action order of two or um, higher at all. So if you are doing um, a, uh, based on a, even a reaction order of one, you will not be very far when you predict the temperature distribution uh, from the model inside a gasifier. And temper predicting temperature distribution inside a gasifier is very important because then you know whether you are creating a condition that takes you closer to the formation of the liquidus temperature. That's why. Right. And then uh, <coughs> this one in here, uh, the overall uh, reaction, uh, reaction rate so you can see that um, the point that I was in, uh, trying to make previously, I have taken it from the gasification book by Higman, because um, they are one of the most practitioners in this. Uh, where in which zone you will be mainly staying at the chemical reaction control zone for calculating the reaction rate under true chemical reaction controlling steps. This was done for, um, uh, I believe for bituminous coal, but they haven't stated it. But looking at the figures, it, that's what it looks to me. That um, uh, they have uh, they have measured it for the bituminous coals. The point here that I only point that I would like to make here is that if you want to measure the calculate the uh, activation energy, true activation energy, then you will be better off to carry out the experiments at the low temperature. Exactly what is low temperature that you you have to do from all the sensitivity type of experiments that I mentioned before. Now, this is the one which is also very important. Um, this shows, again, this is from gasification book. If x axis is my particle size, so very high, large particle size for fixed bed or fluidized bed to very small, 100 micron or less for entrained for gasification. Then see the residence time. 
um, uh, that is required inside the gasifier. And this, if you can recall, in, on day one, I showed the uh, time similar graph for combustion, which was of the order of milliseconds. Here is order of seconds and significant number of seconds. So as, the, as you would expect, as the particle size goes higher and higher, the, um, the, um, you will need to provide uh, longer and longer time to get the carbon converted. So there is, lies the other um, uh, important criteria from gasification point of view that, okay, coal reactivity, gasification reactivity is one important consideration. But then, uh, if, um, uh, shall, I be, um, shall I be better off to have a low temperature gasifier but providing very long residence time? Or shall I be better off to have a large gasifier but uh, provide a um, uh, short residence time? So this is a very good rule of thumb um, uh, indication of how particle size affects the um, carbon conversion time. And it is order of magnitude higher than what you need for combustion. So about the catalysts, um, um, the, um, the uncatalyzed, they, these are some of, the, um, some of the externally added catalysts people have experimented on. Uh, in addition to calcium and magnesium, which are inherently present, people have tried. Um, obviously, the uncatalyzed reaction rate will be less than the lithium-based, catalyst-based reaction rate, which will be less than sodium, less than potassium, less than rubidium, less than cesium. The other two, the, the last two, are not practical ones at all. In fact, none of this actually practical on a large scale. But these are fantastic uh, personal, uh, sorry, scientific, scientific uh, information. So the, the, the other point that I, I make from my uh, observation is that it doesn't lower the activation energy. Um, some people do say it does lower the activation energy, but it cannot. Uh, that's wrong. The pre-exponential constant is what? is significantly affected because without the presence of catalyst, you will need to create a much better environment for the reactants to, to uh, interact. Um, but with presence of catalyst, it's a lot lower. But catalyst catalytic gasification in general is not the way to go for larger scale applications. So this um, uh, stops, uh, finishes this particular module. So I will um, skip through this and across a bed of uh, ash. No, it is absolutely non-standard procedure, it is my procedure. So um, then, um, so apart from the ash, uh, the other important uh, aspect is the physical characteristics of the coal itself, because it is coal which goes inside the gasifier, not, not char. Char is formed in situ. So as I said, some of the coals, not all coals, particularly the low rank ones, as you go from, um, from one direction to the other, we did show it on the first day as well. If you go from here to eventually to here, there um, it will be, um, eventually you come to a very woody uh, nature, very woody nature. And that's very important to understand. Uh, it happens for the lowering coal. 
it happens of course for the biomass also. So in as much as the first three types can be converted by gasifier, but when the coal comes into the last stage or the biomass comes into this last stage, it will be very difficult to convert that through gasification, very difficult because it is so woody in character. So what do you do with it? If you cannot convert it through gasification, then, then you convert that one to combustion, through combustion. And as I showed the on, on day 2, that um, um, day 2, I left my water bottle outside. As I showed in le, uh, day 2, the, the first reaction is the carbon oxygen reaction, even though it is partial, uh, only little bit of uh, substrate chromatic oxygen is given. So, this is the type of material you use for combustion. So, that when it comes to comes at the bottom of the gasifier, where you do the carbon oxygen reaction, you try to convert this type of material. And that is a matter of gasifier design. Um, so, when we I am not sure whether we will show it in here or the other one later on. So, so it is very important to remember the message that coal's physical characteristics is important in as much as the physical uh, in as much as the character of the ash. Hmm? Woody type means you see this this is very woody type. So, this is woody type. So, um, every coal uh, has uh, not every coal, particularly the low rank coals, the upper surface is very, very um, porous. As I have shown in here, then if you look into more detail, it is even more porous, even more porous. But eventually, when you eat away this porous sections of the coal particles by gasification, then you comes to a stage in here which is which will be difficult to convert through gasification every everything is solid but it is not porous at all and if it is not porous it will be difficult to gasify because the um, gasification agents will not be entering inside then it's much better to convert it through uh, combustion generate the heat that way. Very mature coal to some extent, yeah. Woody, yeah. Because at the end of the day, all coals have generated from wood anyway over millions of years. Some have retained their woody character to some extent, some have lost their woody character to a large extent. Even lesser, even lesser. But biomass, the good thing is biomass is uh, biomass is quite porous to start with, and then eventually it will may come to a stage where it will be impervious to the incoming gas. Woody, I, I I think I should have said impervious rather than woody. I should not have said the word, uh, use the word woody, it is uh, it's, um, misguiding. So, impervious. And then we have seen this as well, we have seen this as well. Now, let us come to the different types of gasifiers, which we have shown only 
in, uh, in a schematic in their previous slides. So the first one is the moving bed or the fixed bed gasifier. So you have, um, and this can operate at high pressure. Um, so, so steam and oxygen, I mean the gasification agents are fed from the, from the bottom. Can you see from the distance because I'm sitting here? Um, and then um, the coal comes from the top. Uh, this is the feeding system. There's the lock hopper. And um, so the highest uh, or the, uh, the incoming coal essentially sees the uh, lowest temperature gas going up from here. So this is a counter current gas solid flow. It's hottest at the bottom, coolest at the top. So there is a temperature gradient. That's important. Particle size wise, they have to be very, very coarse. This cannot tolerate fines or coals which generate fines. <coughs> it's it's okay only for non-caking coals and hard coals. Hard coals means soft, not soft coals, which means the, uh, there is one, uh, another way of classifying coal other than uh, lignite, subbituminous, bituminous, anthracite, etc. One is the hardness, based on the hardness. So lignites and brown coals, etc. are soft coals. Some of the bituminous coals are hard coals, not all. Um, that means the, to, they will be so hard that you will need a hammer to break them. Um, the reason uh, moving bed gasifiers cannot tolerate fines is that if fines are generated, then the fines will become compressed inside the gasifier and therefore it will not allow the gas solid contact. So that's the reason why the, the non-hard coals or the soft coals are not, not good for this type of thing. But they have, uh, because um, it's a low temperature, and as I mentioned the other day, um, the, the role of steam is not just for um, gasification, not just as a gasification agent, but also for controlling temperature. And therefore, if, as the temperature here is quite low, you need very high amount of steam. Ah, at the, okay. So at the topmost layer, what you have is um, incoming coal, um, I, I, the uncondensed, sorry, unutilized uh, steam that may be in the form of water or maybe not. And of course, uh, if you are sending the oxygen through air, then that will also be there. So that's what it means. So in the freeboard from where the uh, gas is extracted after the cooler, in that region, these are the ones that you will be having. Uh, of course, then uh, you will be um, uh, separating the incoming co uh, the coal through the cyclone separator anyway. Apart from the gas that is generated, so that's the point. Caking, caking is like you know, uh, just like cake. It's uh, some of the <laughs> some of the coals as you hit them. This has become cake. Uh, they melt and then they just uh, become unpredictable in their behavior or different shape, and uh, the surface becomes smooth, all sorts of things. So, caking coals are, uh, are very nasty uh, coals to deal with. Combustion, not a problem, but gasification.
so not a problem. So, because the ash comes in the form of dry ash, so that is the one of the advantages, but then again because of the low temperature, carbon conversion is low. So, quench is done um, in order to quench out, um, uh, condense out sorry, any of the alkali vapors. So, because the temperature here is uh, and, and the other thing also is that uh, these are very large particles, temperature is very low and um, uh, therefore, not in the and the particle sizes are very large, it can provide generate tar as well. If if um, uh, these are bituminous coals, but for uh, lignites and others for fluidized bed tar is not a problem. So, the quench is done for used for these purposes to condense out the tar, to condense out the alkali vapors. Sorry. So, uh, where is that liquid was? It is full of nasties, uh, because it will be full of heavy organics. Uh, 50 years ago that was not a problem, you just dump it, but now EPA will come and come and catch your throat. So, and for good reason. So, uh, also, so the quench cool, uh, quench uh, li the quenched liquid is a problem, is a big problem. So, only way you can dispose it is in the in a fluidized bed combustor, nothing else. Similar to black liquor from paper mills, uh, which has a lot of nasties. The way it is dispersed, uh, the, um, disposed of is in the uh, fluidized bed. Yeah, yeah. CH sludge. So all the non-conventional fuels and also biomass, etc., are ideal for uh, fluidized bed combustor. CH sludge for gasification will be a problem because it has got so many different unknown uh, heterogeneous material. Gasification is very very susceptible to um, to uh, variations of gas sorry the quality of the fuel. So CH sludge, okay, if it is known reasonably. Uh, quality quality is known reasonably well, then potential Co composition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maintain a temperature which does not create create agglomeration. So, for example, in one of the Recycling companies in uh, Australia, they are, they are actually a multinational. Um, they had um, because they sort out all sorts of things from waste, and um, so they were feeding everything in a fluidized bed combustor on site. But then the fluidized bed combustor, after a while, it simply won't operate well because it will clog the. Um, distributors in the fluidized bed combustor, and it is all because of the variability in composition. And sewage sludge is, is a very difficult to know composition wise uh, what comes in today, time to time, seasonal as well, and uh, depending on where it is coming from. So, I think sorting is uh, sorry. I mean the uh, ensuring the quality of the sewage sludge is really the key. So if the sewage sludge is coming from, say, the water companies, water companies have uh, produce a lot of sewage sludge. Tell them to um, produce the sewage sludge or maintain the quality of the sludge in such a way that it is uh, reasonably uh, uniform in composition from uh, time to time. Sorry. Yeah, 
it, it I don't know. We faced that problem. I mean, we means not us, but I mean others in Australia. They faced that problem because they were um, uh, because Australia is a vast country. So just uh, dumping it in the in um, in uh, well preserved dikes is not was not an issue. But now it is becoming an issue. So there, the, that's the that's what they said. That look from water companies to water companies, the, the composition of it can, for whatever reason, can actually vary. I don't know why. Um, I don't know the reason. Uh, I think the other issue is that uh, what goes in the sewage sludge, um, the sand and the clay and everything, all the rubbish. Fluidized bed combustors, you have to have external bed materials all the time. Uh, because in a fluidized bed combustor, what happens is 90 percent of the material is bed material. Only 5 to 10 percent is actually fluid. I uh, sorry, the uh, feedstock fuel. Um, so, so, um, so that is how it is always, even though. Gasification is other way, correct? It's other way. And then um, um, the entrained flow gasifier, and finally, I think I'll come to fluidized bed gasifiers. And there are uh, different uh, different um, uh, manufacturers. Some of them I have named in here. Um, the the last two are Chinese, but the Chinese gasifier manufacturers have significantly increased in the last 10 years or so. So, there are different, um, uh, different ways of uh, having the entrained flow gasifiers, depending on how you are feeding the coal, whether you are feeding it in a dry, uh, uh, dry mode or feeding in a uh, slurry uh, mode. The slurry feeding ones are the GE and the E gas, it used to be Conoco Phillips gasifier, uh, now E gas. And, um, and all except uh, Mitsubishi are oxygen blown gasifier. That means it is predominantly oxygen, high purity oxygen that you feed in rather than, rather than air. And temperature? Mm, no. No. Up until now, no. So they are, um, in order to have simplicity, they uh, go for simple oxygen feeding because it may. If you want to feed in our CO2, then you have to cool it down. Calorific value will also go down. Even though you can uh, calorific value will not go down because you are converting the CO2 to CO uh, in the gasifier. So, uh, but, um, but you will not be getting any hydrogen. So, there are different um, uh, philosophies whether you will get um, just enough calorific value and uh, have all the gas as CO or um, slightly higher with a mix of CO and hydrogen etcetera. Um, Dry feeding is better in the sense that water is not going into the gasifier, um, but dry feeding is quite difficult, very difficult. Uh, uh, they can, uh, in order to dry feed, you need to have uh, at the entry point to the gasifier or close to that, a 2 3 percent moisture only. So, what they do is um, they pre dry the coal if it is necessary, and then closer to the gasifier entry, they have the hot nitrogen. The nitrogen comes from the air separation plant. Uh, air separation plants produce oxygen and nitrogen. What do you do with the nitrogen? If it is an IGCC, part of the nitrogen can go into the gas turbine, 
and then the other part can go here. So, so the so so the uh, if it is your uh, gasifier, and then the coal is coming from here. And to the uh, from the lock hopper and it's simply to all the feeders and all then closer to the gasifier you uh, have the hot nitrogen which releases the moisture from the matrix of the coal still the moisture goes inside the gasifier but at least handling the coal the rheology of the coal gets better so that the coal can f go inside the gasifier without much of a uh, blockage and hiccup. You come to that. All lock hoppers are semi intermittent, semi intermittent. But uh, this can be uh, this can be uh, so programmed that the uh, the uh, intermittency can be confined to about two three seconds. That's not a problem. At the end at the end of the lock hopper, eventually inside the gasifier, screw feeder. Yeah. And that is where you will have this last bit of heating. Sometimes the, the lock hoppers, the neck of the lock hoppers is also prone to jamming. So, that is where also heating is, uh, heating may be necessary. But uh, the design of the lock hoppers have been increasing, uh, improving. Uh, quite a lot, so that those problems are becoming lesser of an issue now. But whatever be the case, closer to the gasifier, you really need to heat it up. And there are a lot of spare heat available anyway. I and mean, it's a, such a small area to heat uh, because it's closer to the gasifier. Even electrical heating is fine. A little bit of extra energy needed. So shall we? Only for low temperature gasification. So, say for example, you have the moisture, so now I will ignite, so 30 35 percent moisture. Yeah. So, if you have more water supply, more water in the slurry, then you have to supply more oxygen, more oxygen. So, that is the, that's the uh, compromise. Even though feeding is improved, but oxygen supply is increased and oxygen is expensive to produce. Okay. So, digressing a little bit, you have say you have coal which is 30 35 percent moisture in it. If you think that I will get use that water only to make it slurry or even our coal which is 60 percent more moisture in it, if you use that to say that I will use that water as a slurry. Uh, slurry water, it will not work, simply because you will have to grind and grind and grind the the coal down to such a level to release the entire amount of moisture. In the first lecture that I said that moisture is present in different forms inside, it is very difficult to get the internal ones out, because they are so closely bonded. Uh, feeding wise, slurry feeding is simpler, but it comes at a cost, because you are sending so much water inside, coal gas efficiency will drop. Uh, 
Now, the slurry feeders, uh, these are slurry pump, simply a simple slurry pump. So, similar to the principles that are used in cement slurry pumps, exactly the same thing. So, that is well known. So, it is not known. As long as you get a pumpable slurry with the, with the right amount of viscosity of that slurry, it is fine. So, if you supply air, whether stoichiometric or over stoichiometric or sub stoichiometric, you will be supplying so much nitrogen. And therefore, the calorific value of the gas will be a lot lower. Of course, it is cheaper, because you do not need air separation plant, but the calorific value will be a lot less. little bit, little bit, not the same amount as not the 77 percent that we have in the air. So, this is a way of utilizing that nitrogen inside the plant, even though it is a small.
generate the speed to start the loop inside uh, temperature control. Um, so high pressure steam is generated by the CD gas. And the steam gas is taken from the ground. And the slag obviously comes forms um, comes uh, when the bottom of the area of the case. If you then look at the second stage, what actually happens is the oxygen is sent and that is where the C plus O2 reaction takes place. So, it is a much smaller amount of cold flow in there. In the first stage also the sum of the char, the unconverted char from the first stage, it also drops there it gets converted into the combustion process and then everything then goes up from here to there and through this reduced um, cross sectional zone and that is where get you get the, the other, um, other uh, gasification reactions occurring. So, and the um, Syn gas is taken from the top and then it generates steam, it is cooled and then it goes to the cyclone, or sorry the candle filters and if there is any unconverted char, it will still be unconverted char that is fed back to where not in the first stage because the char has become quite unreactive, there is no point trying to convert it through gasification, it will simply build up it goes to the first stage. So, this is how even though it is the same slurry feeding, this is how manufacturers differentiate themselves in their offering and they get the IP that way, patent that way. So, this is just one example that I showed. So, if it is so in the first stage what you are having? In the first stage you are having a combustion which is producing carbon dioxide, which is producing water vapor, those are reacting agent, it is you are not feeding them in the first stage, they go up and then they react with the okay. hmm? no need in the study gasifier, because there is so much water up. Okay. So, so, what is slurry feeding? The slurry feeding you have the solids content is only about 40 percent, rest water, huge amount of steam, huge amount. So, you do not need any more uh, to temperature control. So, the point I am making is that this also as you see is actually also a two stage gasifier, even though they do not call it two stage, but clearly it is evident that it is a two stage gasifier. in the bottom one, the big one, because combustion is fast. So, you do not correct, combustion is fast. So, you not, do not need a taller one, that is why it is like that. And you are having the uh, bigger one at the uh, bottom, the first stage, simply because you can feed it from different directions. So, this the point I make is also that these are not suited for high moisture lignites, because uh, high moisture lignites to make slurry out of them, you already have water which in order to add more water into it, even then it, uh, it will be difficult to make a pumpable slurry. So, no
yeah, yeah. So, the syngas is cooled here, here and then it is separated in the candle filter of the particles. Candle filters means I was I will cover that in the flue gas cleanup or fuel gas cleanup module. Um, they, they separate out the uh, particles and the candle filters they operate in the sense that as soon as the pressure drop across the candle. No, it is different. So, the candle filters so either metallic filter or ceramic filter and as soon as the pressure drop uh, increases across the filter then you know that the uh, there has been particle uh, deposits. So, you send pulse air through it to dislodge the particles goes at the bottom. So, this can be all be controlled from the control room the pulsation quantity of air that you pulse or quantity of nitrogen that you pulse that is another area where the uh, nitrogen is used and the, the frequency at which pulsation uh, is carried out. Mm -hmm. And the only difference is it is a bag over there and here it is because it is corrosive. Uh, gases, ammonia, hydrogen cyanide, sodium vapor, etcetera. So, you need something which is tolerant to these gases. Hmm? Low motion. So, if the coal has only 10.
oxygen and number 3 is the CO2 is lot less, so not bother with storage. So, that was the philosophy when they first started, now their philosophy has changed. Geo sequestration, geo sequestration. No, CO2 storage I mean um, you know when CO2 became the um, became the significant source of concern, um, then people start to look at how this CO2 can be taken away from the atmosphere rather than being released to the environment through the chimney. So, then came all the research and development work significant and billions and billions of dollars work on CO2 capture, which I think you will hear about next week. And then okay, if you can capture it, what will you do with it? You can of course, you can uh, you can utilize it theoretically for chemicals production, but the technology is not there yet. And secondly, then people looked at okay, store it underground in the disused um, uh, oil wells or gas wells and, and for enhanced oil recovery as well. So, all sorts of things, but of course, then there is a question of source and sink matching that where the sinks of CO2 storage are versus where CO2 is emitted, if they are um, hundreds of kilometers away, then in order to cryogenically cool it, transport it and in order to transport it through the pipeline, the, um, the acidic vapor contents in the CO2 has to be very, very low. So, CO2 clean up is also a tremendous factor, otherwise uh, these things will not work. So, the Mitsubishi's argument was there that let us not worry about CO2 storage at all, let us <laughs> release less even though it is a fallacy, because at the end of the day over a period of time you will be releasing it anyway, if, if a certain amount of electricity production is your uh, objective, whether you do it um, um, if you are if 500 megawatt electricity production is your objective, then whether you do it from the gasifier or from the combustor still be releasing the same amount of CO, I mean not same efficiency is different, but high amount of CO2. Just because in PF fired boiler CO2 concentration in the flue gas is lot less compared to the gasifier does not mean that you will not have that problem. So, anyway.
Bolo. Ja, ešte...
then you can overcome it. Two, two, three meters, the large, the large ones. So essentially, it depends on the, um, 
your total megawatt electricity, I mean the capacity. So that will dictate how much uh, coal you will be feeding. And then, um, then um, that will then dictate what will be the, what will be the uh, um, height of a slumped bed, I mean a fixed bed. Uh, for a given diameter of the uh, gasifier. And then from there you will calculate what will be the height of the bubbling bed. So that is how you will do, because you know the, um, uh, the velocity range for bubbling conditions, say anywhere between 0 0.3, 0 0.4 to about 1, not much over, over 1. So that is how it is. Um, theoretically, Fluidization, theoretically, fluidization is not affected by the bed height. It is affected by the size of the particles. Uh, you know, the Gildert particle size classifications, Gildert C, B, A are there. So, depending on where your particles are, uh, that is where uh, you will know what is the fluidization velocity that is likely to be applied for the bottom part, which is a bubbling fluidized in here. So, but it will not be any more than 2 meters or so, uh, 2, 3 meters or so. No, um, carbon conversion is a function of residence time um, and temperature. So, as soon as you have fixed the temperature from the agglomeration point of view, as soon as you have said to you as the designer, I want go beyond 900 degrees centigrade. So, you have set a limit to the carbon conversion from the temperature point of view. Then comes the residence time from the bubbling velocity point of view. Uh, the residence time can be reduced if you reduced your, if you reduce your bubbling velocity, right. If you reduce your bubbling velocity too much, the bed will not act as a gasifier, because at the end of the day, you need a good gas solid contact. So, there comes another limit, right. So, there is a balance that you need to strike. So, say in law, and the other thing is, um, as time goes inside the gasifier, the, uh, the ash particles will be generated more and more. Some of the ash particles will go high above in the freeboard and then go to the cyclone and then come back. But ash being ash, if they start agglomerating, ash has a lot higher density and density has an effect on the bubbling fluidization velocity. If you calculate the, uh, if you see the formula for calculating bubbling fluidization velocity, you will see a couple of things there. You will see the particle size, you will see the density differential between the particles and the gas, the fluidization gas and something else. So, that that is where it will get affected, that you cannot go, uh, that you cannot indefinitely think of increasing the residence time. So, how then do you take care of the um, complete conversion or as high a conversion as is possible by putting in more oxygen, but then if you put in more oxygen then the temperature will try to get away, then you have to put in more steam. Otherwise, it will, you will be generating, in, generating lot of agglomerates, which 
melt uh, at a lower liquidus temperature. So these are some of the issues that you need to be uh, aware of. Uh, circulating so three to five, three to five bubbling, bubbling is around one. They don't, they don't, they don't go below one at all. To in order to. Now, they go for slightly higher range in the bubbling mode is because, okay, let me digress a bit. Theoretically, bubbling velocity, bubbling, uh, sorry, fluidization velocity is not a function of, uh, 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 is not a, is, is dependent on the particle size. But at the end of the day, what is the role of bubbling? The role of bubbling is to provide a good gas solid contact. That is not captured in the expression for the fluidization velocity calculation at all. Nothing exists there. So, as you would expect, um, you can provide a good gas solid contact provided you have a high enough uh, uh, velocity. So, that everything will be nicely fluidized and therefore, contact between the gas, reacting gas and the solids will be better. And mind it though, mind it though, that uh, the, when we take the velocity, consider the velocity is a velocity at that temperature. So, compared to, uh, compared to um, uh, atmospheric conditions, you are already seeing a fourfold increase in the gas velocity going from ambient temperature to 900, which is say 1173 or 1200 roughly. So, threefold increase, uh, fourfold increase, sorry. So, that is what you need to consider. But usually, they do not go too much below. Uh, but then again, um, in the laboratory gasifiers, the problem is if you go to that high a velocity, because your rig is not very large, you will get a lot of elutriation. In the large ones, it is not an issue, because the reactor is very tall. So, whatever gets elutriated, eventually it will come back through so by falling through the walls. So, it is simply a function of um, size.